This is our final day, the final lecture of Dr. Bart Ehrman here at the church. Um, I know that a few of you have been upset with me because he said there was a part four to this lecture series. Um, I do encourage you to read his book, okay? And you can find out part four, but we are very happy to have him come back again if he so chooses. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Bart Ehrman. Well, thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for coming out. Uh, so uh, I've enjoyed very much being with you. Uh, this has been a very lively time. Uh, so there are some new faces here this morning, I think. Uh, but it, uh, what I'm talking about today does not presuppose uh, what I've talked about before. So this, this will be a bit different. Before I start, I want to mention something that I was going to say at the end. But every time I reserve this to the end, I forget to do it. And so uh, I'm going to start at the beginning to talk about uh, my blog. So I've got a blog. Uh, I don't know if you all get onto blogs and look at blogs, but I want to push my blog for a minute. Um, so it's the Bart Ehrman blog. The, the actual name of the blog is this. Uh, it's called uh, Christianity in Antiquity, the CIA. <laughs> uh, so uh, the blog is... Uh, is something that I do. Uh, I post uh, comments five to six times a week on various aspects of early Christianity. Anything having to do with the historical Jesus or the New Testament, the Gospels, the Apostle Paul, the books that didn't make it into the New Testament, uh, different forms of Christianity that ended up losing out, like Gnosticism and these kind of things. And this is all for lay people. Uh, it's for people who are just interested in this kind of thing. In order to... Um, to get onto the blog, uh, so the deal is uh, there's a membership fee. Uh, it costs uh, for a year membership. It's twenty four ninety five, um, and uh, I do that, and I do the blog itself uh, as a way of raising money for charity. So uh, I don't keep any of the money myself. Uh, I give all the money away to charities dealing with hunger and homelessness. Uh, and so uh, I would encourage you to think about uh, joining the blog. You get to hear about early Christianity five or six times a week. Uh, I answer questions. People ask me to talk about something. I'll talk about it uh, on the blog. Each post is about a thousand words long, uh, and so it's substantive, and uh, you, can, uh, you can participate on it. So uh, you know, I started this thing three and a half years ago uh, as a way of, of raising money. Uh, this last year, uh, we raised $117,000. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, think, about, uh, think about looking at it and seeing what it's like and joining up. So just look for the Bart Ehrman blog on the internet and you will find it. So, uh, right, uh, clicker, here it is. So, the birth of the Trinity. Uh, this lecture deals with uh, a fairly fundamental question. How is it that in uh, traditional Christianity, the doctrine of the Trinity came about? How, how'd that happen? So uh, these are the uh, topics I'll be talking about. Uh, this is kind of an outline of my talk. So I'm going to start with a Christological dilemma and paradox. So uh, remember, those of you who are here don't need any reminding, but some of you uh, weren't here. So uh, Christological, this refers to the doctrine or the teaching about Christ. Um, and what I want to contend is that the early Christians had a kind of dilemma on their hands when it came to their thinking about who Christ was. Uh, there are two dimensions to this dilemma. First, there are passages of Scripture that cause problems because they seem to be at odds with each other. There are passages of the New Testament, as we saw in earlier lectures, where Jesus is clearly set out as God. Christ, in some sense, is God. Now, what I've been arguing is that different people have a different sense for how Jesus can be God, but, but in the New Testament, there are passages that, that call Jesus God. There are other passages, though, where it's quite clear he's fully human. So, which is he? Is he a human or is he God? And so, uh, well, that's, you know, it, it, passages of Scripture make this problematic. Uh, you know, so, some early Christians said he has to be one or the other. He can't be both. I mean, a human can't be God in this thinking any more than a, than a, you know, than a human can be a rock. I mean, they're different things, right? So, well, that, that's, a, that's a dilemma. 
The dilemma was exacerbated by the fact that you had uh, different Christian groups emphasizing different things. There were some Christians in the second and third centuries who said Jesus is a human being and he's not God at all. There are other Christians who said Jesus is a divine being and he's not human at all. He only seemed to be a human. The people who ended up winning out in these debates argued that this side is right in what it affirmed, but it's wrong in what it denies. This side is right in what it affirms, but wrong in what it denies. So they deny, so both are right and wrong, because yes, Christ is human, but he's also divine, and he's also divine, but he's human. So how does that work, though? I mean, how can he be both things? And uh, what ends up resulting is a paradox, that Christ is human and divine. It's not that Christ is like 50% human and 50% divine. It's not that he's like 80% divine and 20% human. The paradox that results is really a paradox. He's 100% human and 100% divine at the same time. And you say, that's not possible. And they reply, right, it's a paradox. That's the paradox. That's, that's the, that ended up being the Christian doctrine. In addition to that little dilemma, there was the theological dilemma, which has to do with Christ's relationship to God uh, and, 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 and the nature of God, Christ's relationship with God and the nature of God. So the theological dilemma is, again, you have passages of Scripture you have passages of Scripture that state explicitly that God, the God of Israel, the God who created the world, is the one and only God. There's only one God, the one who created the world. You have other passages of Scripture that say that Jesus is God. Well, if there's only one God, and God is God, and Jesus is God, don't you have two gods? No, we have one God. So, uh, there were certain Christians who um, got around this theological dilemma by, by saying things such as, uh, Jesus isn't God because God is God. And you had other people who, uh, who said that Jesus is God because Jesus is the God God. And so, the side that won out had to oppose both of these views. They opposed those who said that Jesus was not God by saying that Jesus is God. They opposed those who were saying that Jesus is God because he's the God God, that he's actually God the Father himself for reasons we're going to see. They rejected that. So you've got Jesus who's God, you've got God who's God, but you've got one God. Right. How's that work? Well, the way that's going to end up working is the doctrine of the Trinity, as we're going to see. You end up with the resulting paradox, though, that Jesus is God and God is God, but there's only one God. Okay, so those are, those are the dilemmas that the early Christians were faced with. And, and the paradoxes are, are hard to get your mind around. If they were easy to get your mind around, they wouldn't be paradoxes. So, uh, let me tell you one solution to these problems that came about uh, about 100 years after the New Testament was written. About 100 years after the New Testament, there were Christians who were agonizing over these paradoxes and trying to figure out how it could be possible. And there was one solution that ended up being very popular at the time that eventually was declared a heresy. It was declared to be a false teaching. Uh, I'm calling this a hetero-orthodox solution. <laughs> so uh, that's a word I made up, hetero-orthodox. Uh, the word, the word orthodoxy, uh, the English word orthodoxy, comes from two Greek words that mean something like a correct belief, correct, correct belief, a right doctrine. A right doctrine is orthodox. He, the word heterodoxy refers to some other belief or some other doctrine. So heterodoxy, some other doctrine, is a synonym for the word heresy. The word heresy means a false teaching. And so a heterodoxy is some other teaching other than the orthodox teaching. Now the problem with the terms orthodoxy and heterodoxy or orthodoxy and heresy is the problem is who gets to decide what the correct belief is? I mean, 
The problem is everybody thinks that their belief is the correct belief, right? You don't believe anything that you think is wrong. If you believe it, you think it's right. Because if you thought it was wrong, you'd believe something else. So by definition, as one, one person once put it, orthodoxy is my doxy and heterodoxy is your doxy. <laughs> so, uh, so when historians use these terms, heterodoxy and orthodoxy, they are not talking about which view is metaphysically correct, like which view is really the truth. So, uh, w so w when historians talk about the early, early Christianity and they talk about the orthodox group in early Christianity, the historian's not saying, well, that group is right. They're just saying, that's the group that ended up determining what Christians were supposed to believe. There's one group that ended up winning these debates they called themselves Orthodox, so we'll, we'll call them Orthodox just so we know who we're talking about here. Okay, so, uh, so when I use the term Orthodox, it's not that I personally think that uh, Christ is truly God and he's truly man 100% of each, but that is the Orthodox position, whether I agree with it or not. You know what I'm saying? It makes sense? So, uh, all that's to explain my term heterorthodoxy, <laughs> which is the term I made up. Uh, heterorthodoxy is a view, uh, I'm using that in kind of a tongue-in-cheek way to refer to a view that at the time was considered orthodoxy, but it ended up later being condemned. So, it, it, it's a heterorthodoxy. It's a form of orthodoxy that ended up losing out. All right, well, that was probably unnecessary. But uh, so uh, th this, um, this view is called modalism. So this is a heterorthodox solution to those paradoxes. Heterodox, I just explained, modalism. Right. Um, modalism, modalism is a term that scholars use for a particular point of view of who Christ was that can make sense of how Christ can be God, but God can be God, and there can only be one God. This is the solution. It actually makes a lot of sense, and it might be something that you would find attractive. The solution is this. I, myself, uh, as being who I am, stand in different relationships at the same time, one and the same time. There's only one of me, but I have different relationships. I am a son to my father. I'm a son. I'm a brother to my brother, and I'm a father to my children. So at the same time, I am son, brother, and father. There's only one of me, but it depends whom I'm relating to. God is like that. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's only one of him. Sometimes he's functioning as father, sometimes as son, sometimes as spirit. So he has three modes of existence, which is why this is called modalism. Okay? See what I mean? So that means when, when, when Christ was on earth, he was, this is God the Father on earth. This is God. He, God left heaven to become Christ. Then he died, and he ascended back to heaven. And he sent, uh, so, so you see, fa he's, he's different things at different times, but Christ is the Father at the same time that he's the Son and is the Spirit. Okay, so this preserves the oneness of God and still allows there to be a Father, Son, and Spirit. That's, that is the modalist view. Uh, there were several, uh, th there were lots of people who bought this view at the end of the second century. This was a popular view. Um, we learn from the opponents of this view that, that uh, in fact, the bishops of Rome held this view. The bishop of Rome is the Pope. So, uh, what we would today call the Pope. There were popes who held this view, and the opponents of this view admitted that most people in Christianity held this view. Uh, just giving you the basic view. There were a number of uh, Christian theologians, though, who found the view uh, unsettling and unsatisfactory. None was more witty in his attack on... Thank you. All right. Uh, nobody was more vigorous in his opposition to uh, modalism, uh, the modalistic view, than Tertullian. Tertullian was a very famous 
a Christian intellectual who lived uh, at the end of the second century and the begin, beginning of the third century, so around the year 200, around the t- year 200, he lived in North Africa, uh, in the city of Carthage, North Africa. So, um, Tertullian wrote a lot of books. He wrote books uh, trying to defend Christianity. He wrote books uh, of ethics, where he he was a very, very strict uh, moralist, uh, very strict morals. Uh, And he wrote books against heresies. Uh, And one of the heresies he attacked was this view of modalism that he considered to be a heresy. He called this, he invented a word for this view, Uh, which is even more complicated than my heterodoxy uh, term, he called this view (laughs) patripassionism. Patripassionism. Patripassionism literally means the father suffers. The father suffers. So patri, from pater, Latin for father, and passionism, passion being suffer. So uh, his... His view is that this view, this modalist view, makes the father suffer. In other words, it's the father who gets crucified. And Tertullian thought that was ridiculous. And so Tertullian wrote a, uh, wrote a rather scathing attack on this view in which he, he, he pulled out a bunch of uh, really kind of interesting arguments. One argument he pulled out was he said, look, it's impossible to have and to be the same thing. So... So you have to know somebody having something or being something. If you're married, it's possible that you have a wife, but if you have a wife, you can't also be the wife. Right? And if you, if you have the husband, you can't also be the husband. Uh, or that was Tertullian's argument anyway. So it's important to know. So if, if God has a son, he can't be the son. You can't have and be at the same time. You can't be, have and be the same thing at the same time. Tertullian also pointed to scriptures. Uh, for example, in the Bible, um, Jesus gets baptized and God, the voice of God comes from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I well pleased. So Tertullian says, I have a scripture that supports the idea that the father talks to the son. If you think your patripassionist view is right, you show me the scripture that says, uh, I am my own son. Today I have begotten myself. That's, you know, you don't have scriptures like that. God says to Christ, you are my son today, I have begotten you. So, and so it goes. And, and Tertullian points out, you know, when Jesus is praying, he's not just talking to himself. So, so they're, they're different people, God the Father and God the Son. And so the result of this is that Tertullian came up with a way of describing the relationship of God Christ and God, and he uh, threw in the Holy Spirit so that there are actually three. There are three beings who are all divine, that are distinct from one another, and yet there's only one God, and Tertullian devised the term Trinity for that. Tertullian is our first author to use the term Trinity, which became a very important term in Christian discourse, as we'll see. So, uh, that's the hetero-orthodox uh, solution to the problem, um, the, what I'm calling modalism, and it got attacked by people like Tertullian, and it ended up losing out. But then, how do you explain it all? How do you, you know, if, if that's not the right solution, I mean, that seemed like a kind of neat solution, because you've got one God manifest in three, three persons, but it's only one God. If you reject that, what, what do you think? Well, so about 100 years after Tertullian, scholars have been debating this kind of issue time after time until, uh, until things really came to, the head, to a head at the beginning of the 4th century with a, uh, with a popular preacher named Arius, which led to something called the Council of Nicaea. So 
let me tell you the state of things around the year 300. Christian, Christianity has been growing at this point. It's getting larger. Intellectuals are coming into the faith. They're thinking about these things. They're trying to come up with theological solutions to these various problems. Um, and in the year 300, uh, things start coming to a head. So there was a priest in Alexandria, Egypt, which was one of the largest and most influential churches in the Christian world in Alexandria, Egypt. It was a big church, a uh, intellectually oriented church, and one of the one of the priests in the church was a man named Arius. So Arius was trying to wrestle with the question of who Christ is in relationship to God. So he can't be the same as God the Father, so he's a separate divine being. But in what sense is Jesus God? If God is God and Christ is God, but there's only one God, how does it work exactly? Arius promoted the idea that Christ was a subordinate divinity to God the Father. Christ was a subordinate divinity to Christ the Father, to, to God the Father. In Arius's view, the way it happened was this. God, God the Father, the one who existed before all things, before he created the universe, he created a son to himself. He made his son. The son of God goes way back in eternity, but there was a point before which he existed. He, he came into being at some point of time, so there was a time when he did not exist. When God created his son, he created the universe through his son. And so the son of God created the universe, just as it says in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. All things came into being through him. So the Son of God is the one who created the universe. But he's not equal to God the Father. Nobody can be equal to God the Father. You can't have two beings. Well, for one thing, you can't have two beings who are almighty. Because if you have two beings, neither one of them can be almighty. Because they're not almighty because there's somebody else who's as powerful as them. So you can only have one being that's almighty, and that's God the Father, who created his son, who created the universe, and then came into the world to die for the sins of the world, and then returned to his heavenly realm. And so the son, according to Arius, is a created being who is fully God. He's created as a, as a he's God, but he's not equal with God the Father. That was Arius' view. Arius' bishop, Alexander, who was a very powerful figure in Christianity at the time, was not happy with this solution to things. Alexander thought that Arius was underestimating the importance of the Son of God and was devaluating who the Son of God really was. Alexander's other view, Alexander's other view came to the fore in a number of debates that happened in Alexandria. What Alexander's view was was that the Son of God, Christ, had always existed, just as God the Father had always existed. Christ had always existed, and he was not a subordinate deity to God the Father. He was equal to God the Father. These two are equal in power, in might, in grandeur, in every way. They might have different functions, but they're equal. And so, and the Spirit is also equal. The three are equal with one another. One is not subordinate to another. Alexander uh, pressed his views against Arius, and a big eruption happened within Christianity. Throughout the entire Christian world, people were arguing this question. Is the Son subordinate to the Father, or is he equal with the Father? Is there a time that the Son came into existence, or has he always existed? These were the debates that resulted in the Council of Nicaea. Now, many people in our world have a wrong understanding of the Council of Nicaea. Um, the reason people have the wrong idea is because they've gotten their information principally from that one inestimable authority 
Dan Brown, author of The Da Vinci Code. So, uh, the Council of Nicaea figures in the Da Vinci Code, and virtually everything that Dan Brown says about it is wrong. Uh, so I tell my students at Chapel Hill that if they if they want to if they want to know about the history of the Middle Ages, the way to learn about that is not to watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And if you want to know about the history of early Christianity, the way to do that is not to read Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. So, um, according I mean according to Dan Brown. The Council of Nicaea, he says all sorts of things about the Council of Nicaea. Everything he says about it is virtually everything is wrong. Uh, there's a common view, for example, that, that he's, he popularized it, but people had this view before he came along, that the Council of Nicaea is when Christians decided which books would be in the New Testament. Where, where did you finally get a canon of the New Testament? Who decided those books? Oh, is that the Council of Nicaea? Wrong! They didn't even talk about it. It wasn't an issue at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, the, the first person to come up with our list of 27 books of the, of, of the New Testament was somebody who was at the Council of Nicaea, but he didn't come up with his list of books for another, another uh, 40 years. So uh, it was a man named Athanasius. The Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with the formation of the New Testament canon. Uh, the other thing in Dan Brown's book is that uh, what Dan Brown indicates is that at the Council of Nicaea, they, uh, they were deciding whether Jesus was the Son of God or not, and they took a vote, and it was a very close vote. So Jesus barely made it in as the Son of God. The reality is the Council of Nicaea was not a council to decide whether Jesus was the Son of God. Everybody at the Council of Nicaea agreed Jesus was the Son of God. The question was, in what sense is he the Son of God? Is he the son of God who was made by God in eternity past to create the world, or who's a subordinate deity, or is he the son of God who's actually equal with God who existed forever? Which is it? This was the debate at the Council of Nicaea. A vote was taken. There were, uh, there were over 300 bishops from around the world who came together for this council. This is the first, uh, this is the first of seven ecumenical councils of the early Christianity. There, throughout, in the early early years, there were seven church-wide councils that made decisions about theology and practical matters about, for Christianity. And this is the first, the Council of Nicaea. This council was actually called by the Roman Emperor Constantine. The Re Roman Emperor Constantine had converted to Christianity in the year 312. And now, 13 years later, he, uh, he has called this council because he wants Christians to work out this problem. Constantine the emperor was not a theologian, and he actually didn't care which side won this argument. He thought it was a trivial matter that really didn't, didn't signify for anything, but he knew that the church was split over it. And Constantine did not want a split church. He had affirmed Christianity in part because Christianity could provide the unity that he needed, the cultural unity that he wanted in his empire. But if Christianity is going to be used as a unifying force for the diverse cultures of the Roman Empire, if Christianity is going to be the unifier, it has to be united. It has to be unified. And so... Solving this problem was important for, for Constantine, so he called together all these bishops. They came to the city of Nicaea, and they debated, and they took a vote, but it wasn't a close vote. In the end, over, after these 300, these 300 bishops got together, uh, basically, it was just two or three guys who refused to sign off on the statement that resulted. Arius lost the debate. Arius lost the debate. The uh, side that supported Alexander won the debate, and it was decided at that point that Christ is not a subordinate divinity who is less powerful than God the Father, who came into existence at some point in the past. Christ is fully equal with God. He has the same power, the same grandeur, the same honor, the same everything as God the Father, and he always existed. There never was a time before which he existed. So, there, were lots of, there have been lots of arguments over the years for why it has to be that way in Christian theology. Let me just give you one, one kind of interesting argument for it. If you say, no, I can't start it that way. I, say, I have to start it like this. 
If something is perfect, it can't change. Because if it's perfect and it changes, then it changes either to the better or the worse. If it changes to the better, then it means before that it wasn't as good as it could have been. If it changes to the worse, then it's no longer perfect. So for something that is perfect cannot change. Okay, That's the argument. If you say that God created Christ the Son at some point in eternity past, then you're saying that at that point, God became the Father. But if he became the Father, then he changed. And you can't change if you're perfect. So Christ had always to exist. And God was always the Father. That's the argument. See how it works? It's kind of clever. So, um, right. So uh, the Council of Nicaea, uh, 300 bishops, over 300 bishops, they take a vote. The emperor was in charge of this council. He ruled over it. Uh, the vote ended up going against Arius. What was that? Yeah, the vote ended up going against Arius. And so, uh, this, was, uh, this was a significant moment in the history of Christian theology. The Holy Spirit was admitted as being part of this trinity at Nicaea, but his status wasn't talked about very much. It was only in later decades that theologians worked out the implications of what happened at the Council of Nicaea and that the Spirit was thrown in and you ended up with a trinity in which you've got three persons, all of which are equally God. The three persons are distinct from one another. They are three different persons. All of them are equally God, but there's only one God. This is the resultant doctrine of the trinity. So, there's only one God manifest in three persons, all of whom are fully God, all of whom are equal, but there's not three gods, there's only one God. Now, if you say that doesn't make sense, uh, you're right. Uh, it doesn't make sense if you're trying to think through it logically, because there's not a logical solution to this. It's understood to be a mystery. Uh, it's a mystery because you can't really figure it out. People always have ways of trying to figure this thing out, but, uh, but every example you use is problematic because there's nothing like it. So people say things like, well, it's like H2O. You know, it can, be, it can be ice, it can be water, it can be steam, but it's all H2O. Yeah, but that's modalism. That's God sometimes being Father, Son, or Spirit. Uh, but he's not, so it's not ice, water, and the, the same molecules are not ice, water, and, and steam at the same time. The, 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 whole, the, the Trinity all exists at the same time as three distinct persons, yet there's only one God. Um, but Christians were insistent they were not polytheists, they were monotheists, but God is manifest in three persons. And so, uh, and so, so it goes. Uh, let, me, uh, let me say something about the residual effect. I'm going to leave a little bit more time for questions since we only have an hour, hour this morning. So Jesus, Jesus, by the Council of Nicaea, ended up being God. Not a subordinate God, but God from eternity past. Christ had always existed as God and was equal in glory with God the Father. This is well beyond what you find in the New Testament in its affirmations of who Christ is. And it is so far beyond anything that came out in the teachings of the historical Jesus that you just wonder, is this the same religion? Is it the same religion? Jesus was preaching that there's going to be a judgment of God soon when God intervenes to destroy the forces of evil and set up a good kingdom on earth. And Jesus might have thought that he was going to be the king of this new kingdom. That was Jesus' teaching. Now the teaching about Jesus is that he was God, equal with God the Father, for eternity past. Not just billions and billions of years ago, every, the, the whole, all the way back. There never was a time when he didn't exist with God as an equal. With, that, is, that is so different. Well, yeah, it is different. <laughs> you know, welcome to the historical study of Christianity. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is, yeah. So let me say something about residual effects. Christians and pagans. Um, Constantine was the first emperor to become a Christian. 
uh, the first Roman emperor. And the deal is that the emperor of the Roman Empire had always understood that he was the head of uh, the religions of the empire. During, during pagan days, back when the Roman Empire started, the Roman emperor was the Pontifex, uh, Pontifex Maximus, the Pontifex Maximus, the, the main priest for all of Roman religion. Romans understood that the leaders of the empire needed to be pleasing to the gods so that the gods would, would treat the empire well. And so the empires always took a, a strong stand on religion. They didn't have the idea of a separation of church and state the way we do. Their idea was that the gods have made the state great, and so the state sponsors the worship of the gods. Worship of the gods was a state religion. When Constantine converted, he kept that view, which meant that he felt that he could intervene in church affairs. Even though he wasn't a theologian, he was going to promote certain points of view. And if the Christian view is right, then that means that all these other older religions are wrong. The result ended up being within uh, the Roman Empire that the Roman emperor turned from persecuting the Christians to outlawing the pagans. By the end of the 4th century, it became illegal to sacrifice to pagan deities. And eventually, of course, Christianity took over the, the entire empire. Would that have happened if Constantine had not converted? I don't know. Uh, nobody can, can know. But my guess is that uh, it's not unlikely someone else would have converted. It would have happened eventually, probably, I, I suppose. Uh, but it means that people who subscribe to the, uh, the older pagan religions eventually found themselves on the out. They either had to convert or, uh, or they wouldn't be allowed to practice religion. So, Christians and Jews, the charge of deicide. So, as early as the New Testament, you have the accusation that it is Jews who killed Jesus. Historically, this is not correct. The Jews did not kill Jesus. The Romans killed Jesus. Jesus was crucified by order of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, and was executed by Roman soldiers. I've always thought it was inter it's interesting that Christians throughout history have said that the Jews killed Jesus and persecuted Jews as a result, but they've never said the Italians killed Jesus and persecuted the Italians as a result. I mean, why is that? It was the Italians who did it. It wasn't the Jews. <laughs> so, uh, it's, yeah, one of the quirks of history. So, um, Jews had long been accused of being responsible for Jesus' death. And so, later on in history, as you know, Jews are being called Christ killers. But things got worse once people thought Jesus was God. Because if Jesus is God, and the Jews killed him, it means the Jews killed God. That became a charge against Jews, even before the Council of Nicaea, the charge of deicide, that the Jews have murdered their own God. In fact, he's the only God. They murdered God. Well, uh, you know, if you kind of want to ratchet up the rhetoric to heighten uh, the hostilities, that's a good way to do it. To accuse someone not just of being, you know, oh, you know, you didn't know any better or anything. No, you killed God. You, know, you did it. And so uh, this, this led to some very uh, unfortunate uh, kinds of anti-Judaism through the centuries, eventuating in modern times in the rise of anti-Semitism, uh, and eventuating, of course, as we all know, in the, the Holocaust. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying that the Council of Nicaea caused the Holocaust, but, but I am saying that this is, this is participating in this kind of dialectic between, uh, between Jew, this kind of dialogue between Jews and Christians that uh, ended up very badly for Jews over the years. Finally, Christians and Christians, the ongoing debates. You would think that once you get to the point where you say that Christ is fully equal with God and existed forever, you've basically said everything that needs to be said. I mean, what, what more is there to talk about? I mean, that's kind of it, right? Wrong. Uh, these debates started intensifying 
Uh, they, they became even more vigorous after the Council of Nicaea. As the issues got smaller and smaller, the heat got greater and greater, and there were huge theological debates through the 4th and 5th centuries. For one thing, in the 4th century, somewhat interestingly, uh, after the Emperor Constantine, more, most people turned back to, to an Arian understanding of Christology. The, world started, the Christian world started accepting the views of Arius, uh, so that in the middle of the 4th century, there were more Arian Christians than other kinds of Christians, apparently. So uh, there were debates that continued on uh, for, some, uh, for some years and some really kind of uh, mind-blowing uh, debates about, okay, just to give you one example. If you say Christ is God and you say that Christ is also man, how does that work exactly? So ancient people tended to think that human beings were made up of body, soul, and spirit. You've got a body, got a soul, got a spirit. So... Uh, some people said the way Jesus is both human and divine is because he has a human body and soul, but he has the divine spirit. The word that became flesh, the word became his spirit. So, uh, so he's, he's God because he has the divine spirit, but he's also human because he has a human body and soul. Well, that makes sense. But uh, other people said, no, it can't be that way because if that's the case, then uh, he's not really human. Because humans have a spirit. And if he's not really human, he can't die for humans. So if he doesn't have a human spirit, he can't die for human spirits. So he's got to have a human spirit. Well, then how does it work? If that's not right, well, so they had more debates then. They had more councils. They made more decisions. And what ends up happening is you have a whole history of the relationship of heresy and orthodoxy that continues down to today. There continue to be Christians who are insistent on their doctrinal views and they say, if you don't agree with their doctrine, then you're not really a Christian. Um, I grew up with that mentality. Uh, when I was a, uh, a young man, I was a very conservative evangelical Christian. I, I mean, I was a fundamentalist. I was a fairly rabid fundamentalist. My students often ask me, what do you exactly mean by fundamentalist? And I tell them there's an easy definition of fundamentalist. A fundamentalist is no fun, too much damn, and not enough mental. <laughs> so, so that's what I was <laughs> for, for some years. Where we thought, we thought, for example, Catholics are not Christians. You know, Roman Catholics are not Christians. You have to convert them if they're going to be Christians, because they're not Christians. You know, people, so this heresy orthodoxy thing has gone on for a long time, and it continues down till today. And the idea that Jesus is God has always been kind of central to that. It's been fundamentally central, central to it. I'll just wrap up here with just a, a couple of comments. Uh, I think the main comment I, wanted to, I, would, I would like you all to take away from these three lectures is that Christianity was a religion of development. What we think of Christianity did not emerge right away. Christianity, in many respects, is not so much the religion of Jesus, the religion that Jesus had. It's really more the religion about Jesus. That's an irony, that it's not so much the religion of Jesus, it's the religion about Jesus. And that religion about Jesus changed, modified, transformed over the years, and in this way you could say it was even invented over the years, because it isn't what Jesus was preaching. Jesus was a Jew from rural Galilee who understood himself to be Jewish and probably had no idea of starting a religion. He was preaching Judaism the correct understanding of Judaism, but Christianity became something else. It became a religion of Gentiles, and Christ ended up being not an apocalyptic prophet, but God himself. It's a remarkable change. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. We have a little bit of time for questions. Yes, in the back. Yeah, so in the Council, what was the talk about the Holy Spirit? Uh, the Holy Spirit apparently was not talked about very much at the Council. They were really concerned about the relationship with the Father and the Son. Um, if you read, so out of the Council of Nicaea, there came a, a creed 
that eventually was called the Nicene Creed. I don't know if you, do you say the Nicene Creed in this church? No. Um, the Nicene Creed is said in some, in some churches still today. Um, and uh, the original creed out of Nicaea says who the Father is, God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. It says, there's a long section on who Christ is, uh, Son of God, uh, God, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, etc. Begotten, not made, uh, one being with the Father. And then, but when it gets to the Holy Spirit, it says, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, we believe in God the Father Almighty, we believe in Christ, we believe, and in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so it's all it says about it. So it wasn't an issue there. It ended up being an issue later when people had to decide what is the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the other two, and does it have the same relationship to the other two, or does it have a different relationship to the Father from the relationship it has to the Son? And, and so they had these questions. It ended up, the Spirit ended up becoming an equal partner in the Trinity, and so it's also, you know, it's equally God, as powerful as all the other, as the other two. Yes? Yeah, so um, I'm saying that saying these are controversies in the second, third, fourth centuries, and like, are there are there still these things going on now? Are people like getting together to vote on doctrines and things? And so, um, the answer is there that uh, Christianity has become such an amazingly diverse phenomenon that uh, that there's not any kind of unifying discourse about anything these days in Christianity. So there's not like a theological issue that Christians are. Like all Christians are wrapped up in the way they were, say, with the Arian controversy. But questions about how to understand, uh, how to understand God and Christ and how to understand their relationship, but also their relationship with the world, and how to make sense of how people through history have talked about these issues, that is a, a thriving area of uh, discussion and debate and discourse. Uh, and so if you were to go to a, a theological seminary today, you would uh, take classes on theology where these issues would be discussed, both the history of the question, but also modern ways of understanding these things. And theologians write books uh, all the time about, about these various things. And so it, it is still a lively area of discussion, but it's not a discussion that's really kind of, uh, you know, racking the Christian church the way it was back in the fourth century. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So he's asking, why, um, why did Constantine see Christianity as a unifying force? I mean, it's just this minor little religion. So, um, all right. Well, Con Constantine's a very complicated subject, uh, and his relationship to Christianity is very complicated. Um, in Constantine's day, uh, Christianity had been growing at a fairly, at, at an impressive rate. And in Constantine's day, probably about 10% of the Roman Empire was Christian. So five or six million people were Christian. So it was a sizable minority. It was still just 10%, but it was, it was growing and becoming uh, more, more influential. Um, so the reason most people were religious in the ancient world was because the gods could provide them for things that, um, that they couldn't provide for themselves. So the gods were, uh, gods could provide uh, health, and gods could provide uh, crops, and gods could provide uh, relief from drought or famine, or gods could heal the sick, or gods could do things that humans couldn't. And people worshiped gods because the gods were powerful and could do these things. If somebody became convinced that the Christian God was more powerful than the other gods, then since the reason to worship the gods is to have access to that divine power, then you would join the Christian God, which meant you'd have to reject the others. Constantine claims that, um, that at one point he had a vision of Christ. So he obviously knew who Jesus was, and he, and he, he knew some things. On the eve of a major battle, which was going to determine who would control the city of Rome, 
on the eve of that battle, Constantine says he had a vision of Christ and had a vision in which he saw a cross and the words, by this sign you will conquer. He woke up and he asked his advisors what in the world this could mean, and they said it was a revelation from the Christian God, and you should, you should go into battle with the sign of the cross. So he had his soldiers paint a sign of the cross on their shields. He went into battle, and he won the battle. And he assumed that the Christian God had made it possible, and so he converted to Christianity. So the value, the political value of Christianity is that it was completely different from all the other religions. The other religions were all polytheistic with lots of gods. Well, there's no unity if you've got everybody worshiping different gods in different ways. But Christianity insisted there's one God, um, there is uh, one Son of God, there's one way of salvation, there's one hope, one faith, one baptism. There's, it's, it's about oneness. And so the political advantage was that this gives us oneness. And so in, a, in, a, in an empire that's completely fragmented, Christianity could be seen not just as a religion, but as a political solution. So that's why, in a nutshell. Yeah. Yes? Is, Chris, Chris, is Christianity in numerical mind? Um, in some parts of the world, the answer is yes. I think in the overall, uh, in the overall world, the answer is no. It's still growing. Uh, but uh, in some parts, especially in Western Europe and the United States, it's declining. In the United States, um, uh, the, uh, there, there are Christian groups that are growing in the United States. But by and large, Christianity is shrinking, uh, especially uh, mainline traditional Christianity. So mo almost all the major denominations are, are losing members. Uh, and it's, interesting, it's an interesting demographic that one of the things that's growing religiously are the people who identify themselves as having no religion at all. So the, the nuns, as they're called, N-O-N-E-S, different kind of nun, but uh, the nuns uh, are... So people who identify as agnostic or as atheist or having no church connections, that, that group is growing right now. Uh, well, the, the nuns are replacing it. Yes. He's asking, how was the decision of the Council of Nicaea actually enforced? Like, how do you, you know, how do you do that? And that's where having the Christian emperor back, back you really mattered. And so the way it, the way it worked on the kind of practical level is that um, the the people, the the several uh, bishops who refused to sign the the document uh, at the Council of Nicaea, uh, Constantine said, sent into exile. So he, he made them leave their churches and he exiled them. And uh, so that's the kind of thing that the emperor could do. Um, the emperor could use his power in all sorts of ways. Uh, he, could, uh, he could give uh, donations to churches that he agreed with uh, and empower bishops that he agreed with. And he could exile bishops that he disagreed with and uh, remove them from their churches and install somebody else instead. And so those are the kinds of mechanisms they use. Yeah. Are yeah. there are there documents like uh, that uh, of Christian bishops preaching sermons and such, where which in which uh, in which the ideas of Nicaea are put forth? The answer is yes. We do have a, we have a large body of literature from the fourth and fifth, sixth Christian centuries. A lot of this this is Christian literature that we have, multi-volume sets filled with with sermons and uh, with. Uh, with other kinds of, with writings, commentaries on books, and theological reflections, and ethical uh, uh, treatises. So it's a huge, a huge amount of literature on that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What advice do 
advice would you give for the Europeans and the Americans for developing a strategy for growth uh -huh. or turnaround uh, yeah. that would uh, give us some hope to, to be and uh, find some wind behind our sails? Yeah, right. So, uh, so if the church is in decline in Western Europe and America, what can it do to kind of reverse the trend? And yeah, well, you know, the reality is nobody knows. I mean, nobody, there are smart people trying to figure this out, and they, they can't figure it out. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't have any uh, special wisdom on it. I think, you know, the obvious thing is that the church is not attracting, uh, on the whole, throughout the Western world, the church is not attracting people as much anymore because uh, people are seeing alternatives. Um, and it's hard really to know what, you know, what's, what's driving the increased lack of interest. You know, is it, uh, is it peace and prosperity, for example, is one idea. Uh, religion does much better during times of, uh, hardship and, and war. Um, what is Islam? Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, it gives people what they, yeah, yes. Uh-huh. In, yeah, in these debates or in, the, in Christianity. What role did Constantine's mother play? So Constantine's mother was a Christian. Helena was her name. Um, and she was, uh, she was significant for Christianity because she, she uh, took a pilgrimage to Palestine, which was never done in those days, uh, but she did, to, to look for the holy places. So she started the idea that you could go to the, the land of Israel and uh, kind of walk where Jesus walked, you know, and kind of see, see the places. And she had churches built in places. And so there were a number of churches built in Palestine under, under the Emperor Constantine uh, uh, at the initiative of his mother, uh, including, for example, if you've ever been to, to Jerusalem, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, um, which is still a, a huge structure that thousands of people visit every day, where the Church of the Nativity in Nazareth, these are all because of Helena. She didn't influence policy at all, so far as we know, but, but she was a very avid uh, traveler and a very avid Christian, and, and, and so that, that influenced uh, the construction of churches and such. So do I have time for one, quick, one more quick question? Yes. Yes. Was, were there any women represented at the Council of Nicaea, or was it a male affair uh, with a, a masculine God, Father, Son, and Spirit? No, no woman. The answer is yes, it was all men. Uh, they are all male bishops. Uh, at that time in Christianity, Christianity became a, the leadership of Christianity was completely masculine. Christianity didn't start out that way. Christianity started out as having women who uh, had roles of authority as well as men. Uh, in the New Testament times, women had prominent roles, but by the time you get to Constantine, the, the leadership, the, the deciders, the bishops, the theologians, they're all men. Uh, and so, but it's an interesting story about the role of women in the church at that time, but it's a very long story as well. I, I'm out of time. I need to stop. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed being with you.